Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. It's Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. Being able to see the other side of something you strongly believe in is a good quality and not always easy to do. But as an investor, it's an important thing to be able to do. In this episode, Jack and I look at the reasons why value investing may not work as well in the future as it has over the very long term. From the rise of passive investing to ultra low interest rates to value stocks being less innovative companies, these are all considerations worth thinking about. Value stocks have perked up over the past few months and we are hopeful that the reversion continues. But we take a look at the other side of the argument in this episode, The Case Against Value Stocks Part 2. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the discussion. All right. Two years ago, you wrote an article, The Case Against Value Stocks. I was actually hoping at the time that you wrote it that that might be the final turn and value to starting to work again. Um, but that wasn't the case. And it's been um, you know, a couple years of values relative underperformance, although, as you pointed out in your part two article, the case against value stocks, which you wrote just a few days ago, we have seen at least recently um, a turn, especially in small cap value stocks um, over the last few months. So the performance has certainly been better out of that cohort in the market, but that's not to say that values finally turned the corner here. So um, what I thought I'd do, Jack, is just sort of allow you to maybe open up and, you know, I think these articles where you're talking about the other side of something, you do a really good job at trying to look at the other side and understand the other side, which can either help reinforce your sort of belief in something or maybe um, make you think differently about how you believe in something. So maybe with that, I'll just hand it over to you and you can kind of talk about your idea behind articles like this and sort of where we want to go with it. Yeah, you, you probably didn't get a chance to listen to it yet, but did you hear Corey Hofstein on the Odd Lots podcast that just came out today? Oh, no. No. Yeah. So he, he was doing the same exact thing we're talking about here. It's a really good podcast. I'd recommend anyone listen to it, but he was doing it with trend following as opposed to value investing. But all of us, whenever we have a strategy that we believe in strongly, that we think we have data over the long term to support, what do you do when you have a period where that strategy doesn't work? And, and that's the big challenge because it's easy to say that, you know, this time is never different and you should always stick with your strategy and you should never change it. And, and that's probably right most of the time. But then there's other times where that's not right. And that, that's sort of what Corey was talking about with respect to trend following. And, and that's sort of what we have to look at with value as well as say, all right, we have this long-term period where value has, has worked, but then we've got this long period now, the past decade where it has not worked. You know, I, I really have three options looking at that. I can stick with my value strategy. I can make no changes. I can continue to believe in value, but I can maybe change the way I, you know, the, the way I build my value portfolio, or I can say value is dead. I need to abandon value. And, and for me, the reason I wrote the article again is because in, the, in recent months, obviously, these, the types of value strategies we run have been doing very well. Um, it, it obviously pales in comparison to what's happened in the past decade, but there's been a huge run in the past six months. And you know, I feel like whenever you get the, as, as much as you try not to do it, whenever you get a big run in the strategies you're, you're following, you start to be a bigger believer in the strategy. You start to say, all right, this is the turn. This is it. Um, you know, this is finally the time that value is going to get that big run that we've seen in all the historical data. And I wanted to take a, an opportunity because I felt that way. I want to take the opportunity to question myself and say, all right, let's take that article I wrote two years ago. I've learned a lot more about maybe some of the arguments against value. Let's do it over and let's make another case against value, incorporating what I've learned since then. Yeah, I think a lot of these points are sort of things that we've um, uh, talked about on other podcasts with maybe some of our guests or even amongst ourselves. And, you know, just other people that we're following, like Ben Hunt and others who sort of have, to some extent, you know, been putting I some of these ideas out there as to why, you know, value might be broken, or at least why it may not work as well going forward as it has over the very long term um, in the past. But just to kind of get into um, some of the points you made, um, the first one was the Federal Reserve has changed the game. 
Yeah, this was one of the few I didn't update from the original article. I, th I think I put this, you know, f I had a fairly similar language around this in the second article that I did in the first. And the whole point of this is if the Federal Reserve has artificially suppressed interest rates, there's a couple reasons that can be bad for value investing, especially if they're going to, if it's not a short term thing and they're going to continue doing it, which it seems like they're going to continue to doing it. So one reason is because if, if every company is a val is the present value of all its future cash flows, when you have low rates and growth companies have much more of their value in the future, they're going to be worth more relative to value companies. So you can argue low rates are bad for value companies. The other thing is, and Corey Hofstein talked about this when he was on our podcast is when you have low rates, and people need to get a certain return in their portfolios, the only way for them to get that return is to continue to work their way up the risk curve. And, and when you work your way up the risk curve, you're working your way towards some of these high growth type companies. And so that also can be a bad thing for value. So if you believe the Federal Reserve is gonna keep doing what they're doing, then that could be a problem for value going forward. Now what's interesting in this market today is that you have sort of this better performance out of value stocks recently but it looks like the Fed is going to, you know, be on this ultra low interest rate sort of stance for some time, but we're getting the better performance out of value. But I think that might be more of a reflection of higher growth and potentially higher inflation. But if the higher inflation comes, the Fed will probably have to move. So I think the next like 12 to 24 months is just going to be really interesting in terms of inflation expectations and rate expectations um, looking out three to five years. Yeah. If I wanted to take the flip side of my argument, what I would say is something changed with the coronavirus. And what changed is we're now using much more fiscal stimulus, putting money in people's pockets than monetary stimulus. And you could definitely argue when you start to use fiscal stimulus, when you start to put money in people's pockets, you're going to start to get spending. You're going to start to get economic growth. You're going to start to get inflation. And so that could offset some of what the Fed is doing. And that could lead to a better environment for value. And I think that's probably what you've seen with value doing a lot better you know, in the past six months is people are anticipating that type of environment, you know, with a Democratic president and with now, you know, a Democratic Congress as well, you might see more of that and that might lead to inflation and that might lead to higher rates and that might lead to a better period for value. The second point is value needs recessions and it hasn't been getting them. And you have a really cool, this is the first time I've actually seen, I've never seen this chart before, which is basically like showing over an economic cycle the different factors that tend to work at different po points in the cycle. Um, but I think your overall point and what we know is that value tends to work better coming out of a recession because those are a lot of times are the stocks that are beaten up the most. Um, but if we're getting less and less recessions, then there's less and less of those periods where value has the chance to have this explosive growth um, coming out of these downturns. Right. As we get better at managing the economic cycle, we've had less recessions. We have less recessions now than we did, you know, 50 years ago. And so one of the things when you look at the historical performance of value, a lot of the excess return has come in the areas around recessions, particularly, like you said, the, the biggest outperformance has come on the backside of recessions. And we saw that here. You know, we you could argue whether we had a recession. Technically, we did. But obviously, on the backside of that, you've had huge outperformance for value. So that's where value really shines. And so the argument would be, if we're not going to have as many recessions, maybe value is not going to have that period where it really shines. And so maybe that's a bad thing for value going forward if, if we're going to manage the economic cycle better and we're going to have less, less recessions than we used to have. One of the things with, I guess, systematic value investing or the type of value investing that we tend to do is, um, you know, it makes sense to a lot of people. Like it's sense, you know, it's very sensible investing. Um, versus something like momentum. Sometimes people have a hard time wrapping their head around it. It's like, you know, with momentum investing, you're buying stocks that have gone up the most. With value investing, you know, you're trying to buy stocks that are that are cheap based on some type of metric. But your number three point or your third point was, you know, the intuitiveness of the value factor might be its downfall or causing it to have some problems here. Yeah, this gets back to the interview we did with Adam Butler on the podcast. And he, he sort of was talking about a framework where Factors work because for some reason, investors are avoiding the stocks selected by the factor. You know, it could be because they're risky. It could be for some other reason. But that's what gets factors working in the first place is a certain amount of capital is avoiding the factor. Well, then the problem is as you get academic research that identifies the factor and shows that it works, now you get capital coming in. And if that capital coming in exceeds the capital that was going out in the first place, then you have a situation where the factor could not work anymore. And so that's the challenge with value. And, and if you think about it, the more a factor makes sense to people, the more money is going to come in. You know, you get this 
this research that shows us an excess return. And then they, someone says, oh, it makes sense for me to pay less, you know, for a dollar of earnings. That makes sense to me. You know, buying a stock just because it's up like momentum, that doesn't make as much sense to me. So I'm going to pour a ton of capital into value. And you do run the risk that too much capital comes into value. And the reason it was working in the first place goes away. And, and now you have a situation where you have a negative excess return instead of a positive excess return. Your fourth point is passive investing may have broken the weighing machine, which is, as we know, there's been, you know, massive flows into um, passive investment vehicles, things like the S&P 500 or other popular uh, market indices. And I think maybe passive, the amount of assets in passive funds might be about equivalent to the amount of assets in actively managed funds. Um, and that trend has been one that's been in place for, for quite a while. When you have a, a lot of money coming into those passive investment vehicles, to the point you made in the article, what it does is it, it kind of drives, since these indices are market cap weighted, it kind of drives the prices or there's, it, you know, it's money flowing into the largest stocks in the market. And a lot of those stocks aren't necessarily in this day and age, the value type stocks that we think of. Yeah, this gets back to the Ben Graham quote, which is, is the market a voting machine or a weighing machine? And what he said is in the short term, the market's a voting machine. And in the long term, the market's a weighing machine. And, and the way to look at that today is sort of the argument of flows versus fundamentals. So flows would be the voting machine and fundamentals would be the weighing machine. And what we've seen in the past decade is the voting machine has been far more important. Flows have been driving the market far more than fundamentals. And so the question is, you know, if, if we continue to see these trends of people putting money into these passive products, are we gonna have a situation where it doesn't matter what the fundamentals are, flows are going to drive the market for a very long period of time? Because if flows are driving the market and if flows are going more into these larger you know, companies that make up the most of market cap weighted indexes, which are primarily you know, technology and growth type companies, that's not an environment that value may be able to do well in. So if, that's, if the weighing machine doesn't come back, like Graham talked about, if the voting machine stays in place, then that also could be a problem for value. Yeah, and you, you put a link in the article, Investing in the Upside Down, Logic as Michael Green describes why passive flows are corrupt, corrupting the market. So there's we, we will put a link to that um, interview up on YouTube, which you referenced in your article. Um, and the last point, and this is something we talked about with uh, Sparkline Capital's Kai Wu, is that um, you know value, not only is it, is it kind of a bet against technology, because many of the technology companies are not necessarily value stocks, but it's it's more, I think, in the point you were trying to make, it's it's more about a lot of these value companies aren't really disruptive companies, or there's not a lot of innovation happening in the value stock universe. And so as a result of that, um, they're just kind of betting against innovation, I guess, to some extent. Yeah, in my original article, I said value is short technology. And so, and that's true, by the way, um, obviously, you know, most value strategies are either underweight technology, or if they, if they're strategies that, you know, use, use the market cap weights on the sectors, they're typically invested in the technology companies that are not the high flyers. So you pretty much all value strategies are underweight the FANG stocks, which have been driving the market. So that's a true statement. But when you look under the hood, it doesn't it completely explain the underperformance of value. And the reason is inside of these sectors and industries, value has been underperforming as well. So forget the technology sector, go look at the other sectors. Inside there, you're still seeing this underperformance of value. And so what explains that? And what, what Kai did is he used like more of a machine learning process to say, the real thing that's driving this is innovation. And so the most innovative value is short, the most innovative companies within all of these sectors and that explains all of its underperformance, whereas te technology explains some of value's underperformance. When you, when you start looking at innovation within individual sectors, value is buying the least innovative names and it's short the long, you know, the most innovative names. And that's driving the underperformance. So he did some really interesting work. I mean, we'll put a link to his article in the show notes. It's, you know, it's, it's very much worth reading. Um, but it, the overall point is, you know, if innovation is going to continue driving the market, value short position in innovation is not a good thing. Like you pointed out though, and like we've talked about before, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management has some done some research on other long periods of time where value has underperformed. And um, I think they looked at the period from like the late, correct me if I'm wrong here, Jack, the late 1920s through the early 1940s. And that was a period of a lot of innovation happening in sort of manufacturing, I think automobiles and things like that. And what they found was that coming you know, eventually those companies that weren't that innovative figured out how to leverage the innovation. And so you got um, better performance out of value stocks 
after those companies figured out, okay, how to basically use the innovations of, of that time period. That's right. It takes a period of time where, for the, the sort of old line companies to understand what's going on, to understand what's going on with the new technology. And the best ones, the most well-run ones, will eventually figure out how to use the technology. And what they were showing is in that period, that's sort of what turned things. That's what got value moving in the right direction is, you know, they're not going to be, these types of firms are not going to be as innovative as Google, but they don't have to be because there's a huge gap in the valuation right now. So if they can become more innovative, then, you know, that's a really positive thing for their stock price. And so that may happen here. We don't know. Um, it's a little bit different now. Obviously, the, what the technology is is a little bit different, but that may happen here and that may help value get going again. In your conclusion uh, about talking about the future of value and what some of these things may mean for it, I couldn't help but be remembered of the conversation we had with Kai, where when we pressed him and we asked him um, on his thoughts on value, he sort of said, you know, he thought there was a, probably a cyclical opportunity in value given how large the spread was between value and growth stocks, but that from a secular standpoint, a lot of the pressures and the things that maybe we've talked about and the things that he was highlighting um, are probably not good for value. So do you just want to kind of conclude with some parting thoughts here? Yeah, it, it gets right back to what I was talking about at the beginning, which is, do I want to alter my strategy or do I want to run my value strategy sort of the way I have been running it? And, and that's the balance here. And what he's talking about is traditional systematic value is exceptionally cheap right now. Even after this run, it's still exceptionally cheap. And so the question is, if I'm going to go and maybe alter my value strategy, maybe to account for intangible assets or, or some other thing, am I hurting myself in the short term by doing that? Because maybe systematic value is so cheap right now, the, the way sort of more traditionally that it's going to run up a lot. And maybe I'm going to miss that reversion by, by adopting my strategy to maybe head more towards the Googles of the world. So, but then his other point was, over a hundred years, you have to do that because over a hundred years, you know, we haven't talked a ton about intangible assets here, but the, a company like Google can't be valued with the price to book. It just doesn't work. So over a hundred years, you know, I don't want to necessarily continue to use these metrics. I need to change my strategy. And so it becomes a balance, you know, do I bet on this reversion in traditional value, knowing that, you know, once I get that, I have to maybe adjust my strategy more for the times, or do I, you know, do I just continue to run my strategy as is it's, it's a tough, balance i mean i don't have the answer um and I, I think a lot of people are struggling with this because we, we can we can use the past data to tell us so much but it's not going to give us the answer to this only the future will give us the answer and that's what makes it so difficult well i'm hoping that this article the case against value stocks part two is the actual final turn that we've been waiting to see in value <laughs> i got it wrong last time hopefully, hopefully yeah. this time is finally the time i get it right <laughs> exactly all right guys uh thanks for listening uh we'll see you next time thank you Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.